Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. In today's gospel lesson, we have our annual encounter with Jesus' miraculous feeding of the 5,000. In actuality, it was more than 5,000, as Matthew tells us, those who ate were 5,000 men, besides women and children. And last time I checked, women and children are people too. <laughs> so I prefer to call this the feeding of the 5,000 plus. Yet regardless of what you call it, it is the only one, the only one of Jesus' miracles that occurs in all four Gospels. Only one. Now, some will occur in one gospel or two or three, but only this miracle, this miraculous feeding, shows up in all four. And so there must be something to that, an added importance about this miracle that God is trying to highlight for us. The story begins with the apostles returning from their preaching and healing ministry in Galilee. They had announced the coming kingdom of God. They had driven out demons. They had healed the sick. Now they were tired, and they need a rest. Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while, Jesus said. They didn't even have enough time to eat. I think everybody has days like that. I know that for me, usually it'll be like one of those days when you're so busy, you forget to eat lunch, and then you get a call that you got to go to the hospital. So you're eating like one of the, one of the granola bars from your glove compartment. If it's a really bad situation, or maybe if it's uh, not that dire, you're at least getting McDonald's so that you will someday quicker be in the hospital. You can put that math together later. But Jesus famously said that man does not live on bread alone, but you still got to eat. <laughs> so at Jesus urging, they get in the boat, they sail across the lake, the Sea of Galilee, to a deserted spot. Unfortunately... The crowds recognized Jesus' boat, and when they caught wind of his destination, they caught wind of where the boat was headed. Oh, okay. <laughs> Man, it's been a long day, guys. I thought a little humor would be good for us. Anyways, when they caught wind, they hurried along on foot and got there ahead of time. I'm still trying to figure out how that works. I kept looking at maps of Galilee, and I'm like, how does going by foot to get to another... Anyways... But Jesus and the apostles, they got ashore. There was a great crowd waiting for them, so, so much for getting away. But when Jesus saw them, he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. He had compassion on the crowd. And as I've said before, this Greek verb for compassion literally means to feel it in your kidneys, to have gut-wrenching pity. For the huddled masses in front of him. It is a powerful word, and as I've also said before, it's one used in the New Testament only of Jesus and of characters and parables who are stand ins for Jesus, like the Good Samaritan or the Forgiving Father or the King and the parable of the Unforgiving Servant. This is the kind of pity that only Christ feels for somebody. And it's more than just feeling sorry for people. It is the divine compassion for hurting people that Jesus feels in his heart. And what's more, this compassion always moves Jesus to do something. They were like sheep without a shepherd. And so Jesus had compassion on them and began to teach the word. Our Old Testament reading today, our psalm, show us how necessary it is to have a shepherd... In your life. My dad, when he was the pastor at Trinity Lutheran Church in Fairfax, South Carolina, lived right across the street from uh, the church. I don't recommend that. <laughs> parsonages are passe. But a lot of times, people would knock on the parsonage door, and they'd be looking for a handout. And my dad, often his first question to them would be, who is your pastor? Who is your shepherd? And they say, well, what, what, what do you mean? And he'd say, well, well, they'd say, you know, well, I don't, I don't really have a church. And he'd say, well, that's the first part of your problem. <laughs> he said, because if you were one of my sheep in my church, you wouldn't have to go knocking on doors to get help because the people of my church would already 
be helping you. So you need to find a shepherd. My friend Pastor Harmon says, what do you call sheep without a shepherd? Lunch. (laughs) Yet as the day dragged on and the sun began to set beyond the western shore, the disciples whose own stomachs were still grumbling loudly were ready to call it a day. And they asked Jesus to dismiss the crowd so that they could go home and find food for themselves. If home was too far, go to the neighboring villages. The disciples didn't want to deal with these people. They just wanted them to move along. They wanted to make the problem somebody else's. The attitude of the disciples reminds me of how many of us respond to the poor and the needy when we encounter them. It's very easy for us to ignore the man on the corner with the cardboard sign that reads, Anything Helps. We turn away in disgust and a little bit of guilt, and to try to assuage our troubled consciences, we say, he'll just spend it on booze anyway. How do you know? Or a young Mexican couple comes to the church, they need food and a motel stay for the night, and we don't want to deal with it. Besides, they might be illegals. Serves them right. So we just refer them to the task force, or offer them whatever bag of chips or cookies pastor happens to have in his snack stash. Move along. Go somewhere else. Don't bother us. After all, isn't that why we have food banks? Isn't that why we have welfare programs? Let them go there if they need help. This response reminds me of Ebenezer Scrooge in Charles Dickens's classic tale, A Christmas Carol, when some charitable chaps show up at Scrooge's counting house on Christmas Eve to take up a collection for the poor. He responds, are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? Are they still in operation? As if we should just scoop up the poor and put them in jail. Then they can have three square meals a day and make license plates. I pay my taxes, so I've already done my part. Leave me alone. Move along. You're somebody else's problem. Many can't go there, the men reply. Many would rather die. And Scrooge says, if they would rather die, let them. (laughs) (laughs) then there will be less surplus population. But Jesus will have none of these arguments, none of our justifications for our selfishness or our convenience. You give them something to eat, Jesus says to them and to us. You give them something to eat. Jesus is not interested in referrals. He desires mercy. In kindness, he calls us to do something for the poor. You give them something to eat. This is the great inconvenience of being a Christian. Jesus does not let us off the hook from helping the poor and needy. And even after paying our taxes and our tithes, we are still called to help the person in front of us right here, right now. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, when you give to the needy, not if, when you give to the needy. The Bible tells us to remember the poor, Galatians 6, verse 10. And the Apostle Paul writes, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. The expectation, of course, is that part of the purpose of our work is so that we have something we can share with others. Jesus' brother James writes in his famous section on faith and works, If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith, if it does not have works, is dead. Faith without works is dead. That's why Martin Luther's explanation of the fifth commandment includes not just the negative exhortation, we should fear and love God so that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but also the positive exhortation. But rather, we should help and support him in every physical need. This is not merely Pastor Chris's opinion. This is the biblical teaching and our Lutheran confessions. Robbed of their excuses, though, the disciples resort to sass. 
we don't have enough money to buy food for all these people, and where would we get it anyway? Ain't no shops open, Jesus. <laughs> so Jesus asks them to bring what little they have, five loaves of bread and two fish. By the way, I can't help but wonder if there is some kind of symbolic aspect of these numbers, because five plus two equals seven. And seven is the biblical number of perfection, of completion. And what the disciples regard only as a measly meal, presumably for them, is actually quite perfect in God's eyes. It's just enough. For as we shall see, God can take what little we have, bless it, multiply it, supply us in abundance. As we read in the psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. If Yahweh is your shepherd, you shall have no lack. Jesus commands the crowds to sit down on the green grass beside the Sea of Galilee. Green pastures, still waters. Conjures up Psalm 23, doesn't it? And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up into heaven. He said a blessing. He broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. Notice the verbs that Mark employs in verse 41. Take, bless, break, give. Take, bless, break, give. The same four verbs used at the Last Supper for the institution of the Lord's Supper. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. Take, bless, break, give give. I'm not suggesting that Jesus was serving the Lord's Supper uh, on the beach there. He wasn't. He was serving a meal. But as Alfred Edersheim points out, we cannot help but recall the Lord's Supper, the Holy Communion, when we hear those four verbs strung along together like lovely pearls on a string of a necklace. Wondrous things. Miraculous things happen when Jesus takes bread, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it to us. He can feed a whole crowd of people, or he can turn them into his very body for us to eat for the forgiveness of sins. How wonderful indeed. Jesus had told the disciples to feed the crowd, you give them something to eat. But they didn't have enough from their perspective. But Jesus took what little they had, the perfect number, seven. He blessed it. He multiplied it. He gave it back to the disciples for distribution. In other words, they didn't want to feed the crowd. They didn't know how to feed the crowd. But Jesus <laughs> supplied their lack, and he still made them feed the crowd. <laughs> you give them something to eat. And they all ate and were satisfied. In fact, they gathered 12 baskets full of leftovers. They ended up with more food than they started with. God takes care of us. He provides for our needs. Psalm 144. The eyes of all look to you, O Lord, and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living creature. He feeds the sparrows that do not gather into barns. He clothes the lilies of the field. He gives us daily bread, as we pray for in the Lord's Prayer. And as Martin Luther writes, again in the Catechism, he richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. And he gives us abundance so that we can share with others, so we can give them something to eat. For you always have the poor with you. And whenever you want, you can do good for them. Here at our church, we have a wonderful ministry called Orphan Grain Train that collects and sorts and ships and packs clothes to send to places all over the world where people are impacted by poverty and disaster. You know, we've started doing these... Um, these hunger bags, these blessing bags. 
But it's also not enough to just say, my church is handling it. What are you going to do to feed the hungry person in front of you? Remember that God provides for our greatest need of all, the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Jesus, in John 6, calls himself the true bread from heaven. And um, not this year. Next summer, I think, is the summer where you have three weeks in a row of Jesus' bread of life sermon, (laughs) different chunks, right after the feeding of the 5,000. It's like we're dealing with bread for like four weeks in a row next summer. So much for the gluten-free people. (laughs) Jesus is the true bread from heaven. His flesh is true food. His blood is true drink. And he says, whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. It's unfortunate that we don't have the Lord's Supper today. It would be wonderful to feast on the Lord's body and blood, the most miraculous feeding of all. And then we could truly taste and see that the Lord is good. So we'll wait till next Sunday when the crucified and risen Lord Jesus will once again take, bless, break, and give bread for us to eat. And we shall all eat and we shall all be satisfied. And then we'll go out from here with something to give people to eat. In the name of Jesus... Amen. Hello, I'm Pastor Chris Mathis. And I'm Kristen Schmidt, Director of Christian Education. And And we're we're your your neighbors neighbors at at Epiphany Epiphany Lutheran Lutheran Church Church of Castle Rock, Rock, Colorado. Colorado. Epiphany Lutheran Church is a multi-generational congregation shining the light of Christ in Castle Rock. We offer a variety of worship services, including traditional Lutheran liturgy with hymns played on the organ, and also more modern music with our praise band leading us in song. Epiphany offers worship services on Sunday mornings and on Saturday nights for those who work different times on the weekend. And even though our worship services may not be a rock concert, everything we do is built on the solid rock of Jesus Christ, His Word, and His love. At Epiphany, you won't get lost in the crowd. God knows your name, and we will too. We offer activities and programs for all ages and stages. We have Sunday school classes for ages three years old through adult, held every week on Sunday mornings at 9.30, except for a few holiday weekends. We also offer Bible study options throughout the week to allow you plenty of opportunities to grow in God's Word and connect with other Christians. There's also a place for you in our music program. You don't have to be a professional. We have choirs for children and adults, handbells, ensembles of various kinds. We want everybody to participate in worship, even if it's just singing along with the music, because worship is not a spectator sport and everyone's encouraged to make a joyful noise to the Lord. Epiphany also wants to be a good neighbor by loving those in our community who find themselves in need. So if you're hungry, stop by the church anytime during our business hours, and we'll give you a bag of groceries. No questions asked, no strings attached. We also have blessing bags to take to those who are in need or houseless. Epiphany is located one mile west of I-25 on Wolfensburger Road, right across the street from the Santa Fe Quarry Butte. So come see us soon at Epiphany Lutheran, where we are shining Shining the the light light of Christ Christ in Castle Rock. Rock.